Uh, my name is Henrietta Wilson. Um, I'm a freelance researcher and university teacher alongside being a member of the board of directors of Nuclear Information Service. And I'm really pleased to have been asked to chair this amazing event. Um, thank you very much to Nuclear Information Service for setting all of this up and especially to Trish Witham. Um, we've got five incredible speakers lined up that we're about to hear from. Um, who are going to be giving us a wide range of experiences and insights into nuclear weapons and disarmament. Um, so I'm not going to introduce those, them quite yet. I'm going to say a few words about our host organisation first before telling you what's coming up uh, and giving you uh, an, uh, uh, an overview of the running order. Um, so our host organisation, Nuclear Information Service, uh, has dedicated itself to finding out accurate, reliable information about aspects of nuclear weapons uh, that are maybe uncovered and hidden. And in particular, um, some of the implications to the UK of its being a nuclear weapon state. So, uh, for example, uh, NIS works really hard to uncover information about the UK's nuclear weapons lab. It follows planning applications, health and safety reports, the sort of nitty gritty nuts and bolts of how the UK's nuclear infrastructure works. Um, it also looks at broader themes. So most recently it's published a report on the costs and risks of the UK's Trident programme. Um, so please do uh, take an opportunity to find out about the organisation on the internet if you can. This is their 20th year. I think it's a fantastic achievement um, in a, a, an industry that can be quite squeezed. Um, but for today, how today is going to work is we've got five short talks uh, followed by a question and answer session. Please, everybody, do feel free to submit any comments uh, or questions throughout the session using the Q&A function uh, on uh, Zoom. Um, and uh, we've already got some questions, so I'm really excited about that bit. Um, and uh, just to say as well to everybody that this event is being recorded, uh, so you'll be able to see it later on the NIS website. Um, so what, who we're going to hear from is, first of all, David Cullen, who's the current NIS director. And then we'll hear from Jonathan Porritt, the environmental campaigner, followed by Olamide Samuel, uh, who's a senior teaching fellow at SOAS University. Um, we're hoping to be joined by Jeremy Corbyn as well, the MP and former leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and our final speaker will be Kate Hudson, uh, who's currently General Secretary of CND. Um, so I will hand over straight away to David Cullen um, to begin his talk. Thank you very much, David. Thanks, Henrietta. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, uh, thanks also for the intro to Nuclear Information Service. Uh, for those of you who have not come across us before, just a very sort of few quick facts. We were founded in the year 2000 by Di McDonald and our work grew out of uh, particularly Nuclear Watch and Polaris Watch, which were grassroots groups monitoring nuclear convoy movements. And as Henrietta said, we, we monitor the UK nuclear weapons program. We use publicly available sources and freedom of information work and we do our best to tell the public what's going on. I feel that our work is particularly necessary in the UK because it's such a secretive state in terms of its nuclear weapons program. If you look at what's routinely disclosed in the US there's really quite a wide disparity um, and much more is hidden over here. So we do our best to address that. Um, historically as an organisation we've had a particular focus on AWE the Atomic Weapons Establishment, uh, we are situated quite close to them. We're in Reading, they're just outside Reading in Berkshire. In recent years, we've tried to sort of broaden our focus a little bit because there have been fewer independent researchers working in this area. So we've, we've tried to sort of fill the gap as best as we can. A uh, particular recent focus of, of what we've been looking at has been the upgrade project. So it's not widely acknowledged, but in the mid 2000s, the UK, took a governmental decision to upgrade all three elements of its nuclear weapons capability. So that's the submarines, the missiles and the warheads. Uh, the missile upgrade uh, is, is done in the uh, US. I won't say anything more about that, but we look very closely at the different overlapping projects to upgrade the submarines and the warhead. Um, as Henrietta already mentioned, our 2019 report Trouble Ahead, which looked at the 
took a very broad view and looked at the affordability and deliverability of those upgrade projects. And uh, amongst our conclusions were that there was a, a genuine risk to the government stated intention to keep a submarine permanently deployed at sea um, and that the available funds for those upgrade pro projects were not as high as the expected costs and that that latter issue i think is probably going to get more keen in a post coronavirus environment where the questions of, of priorities of government spending will be more acute and in all likelihood the fiscal situation will be tighter um, there are, of course, wider questions about nuclear weapons upgrades um, that our other speakers will be talking about, questions of, of contributions to global instability, uh, threats to the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, as NIS, we don't directly address those questions, but we try and point towards them. We want to provide solid fact, a solid factual basis for that debate to take place, uh, and we very much welcome it. Um, so turning to our sort of future work uh, and the warhead up upgrade, uh, this was the last element of the upgrades to be officially announced. Um, it was announced uh, with quite a telling chronology, first of all in the US Congress and then latterly to uh, the UK Parliament in February. Um, it was, we, we played some role in uh, NIS in, in bringing that um, announcement to uh, the attention of the UK press and that prompted the UK government to announce uh, their plans but the, the plans were long expected we've followed uh, what's now a 15-year program at AWE the nuclear weapons capability sustainment program um, which has been laying the groundwork uh, for this upgrade um, we, of course, will focus um, in, in a big way on the nuclear weapons upgrade and uh, we're planning a major report which will come out late next year or early the following year on, on the upgrade. Uh, and I just want to talk you through some of the key questions we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at the links with the US. So the reason that this announcement came first in the US is that the planned warhead is said to be a parallel development with a planned US warhead called the W93. Uh, and I think there are very big questions over whether the timetable for uh, the US warhead is being driven by uh, factors in the US or by the needs of the UK program. Um, of course, all of this will, will raise the, um, I think rightly in, in, into question the claim that the UK program is independent of the US. I think that's quite a dubious claim and, and we'll, you know, we will talk some, to some extent about that. Uh, I think there's a very, very large and very vital question uh, about whether the upgraded warhead will uh, involve an increase in destructive capability. The W93 warhead uh, is very likely to be a much higher yield than the current UK warhead. Um, uh, the current UK warhead uh, very closely resembles a US warhead called W76. It's sometimes called by, by people in the US, the UK version of the W76. So it's, it's very much an open question whether the UK is planning to develop a weapon that won't have an equivalent warhead in the US arsenal, or whether they're planning to change the uh, destructive capability of the UK warhead. Obviously, if, if it's the latter, that would be very controversial and potentially destabilizing. Um, it's possible that we may see a reduction in warhead numbers in the UK uh, alongside an increase in, cap in destructive capability. That's uh, something analogous has happened in the, the current uh, refurbishment of the UK warhead. They've made it more accurate and at the same time they've reduced the number of deployed warheads. Obviously the reduction is to be welcomed but the fact that it isn't actually relinquishing any um, destructive capability should be, should be emphasised I think. Um, we'll be looking uh, a lot at the infrastructure footprint of the upgrade. Um, so despite the nuclear warhead capability sustainment program being a 20 billion pound investment program, some elements of it have been uh, dropped because of cost overruns elsewhere, um, particularly in the Mensa, the warhead assembly facility in AWE Burfield. Um, so they've dropped particularly the most expensive one, I believe, is uh, Pegasus, a planned uranium manufacturing facility 
which now appears to be going ahead. I'm assuming that that will fall under the budget of the, uh, the new warhead. And it may well be that other supposedly deferred infrastructure projects will also be moved over into the warhead upgrade. So that, that will have cost implications. Um, and obviously we'll be looking more broadly at cost. Um, my calculations for the Trouble Ahead report suggested that the warhead upgrade would cost about 10 billion pounds, but that was a conservative figure. And I could well believe that it will be higher than that. Um, more broadly, we want to ask, and as, as best we can answer, what, what has currently been decided and what is yet still to be decided about this new warhead that the government will be pursuing. And with all our work, as with all our work, we will want to point towards wider questions. What is the opportunity cost of the UK being a nuclear weapon state, what are we giving up by retaining these weapons? And why are the threats that nuclear weapons are supposed to defend us against worth apparently spending hundreds of billions of pounds on, but it's apparently not worth spending a fraction of the cost on maintaining a PPE stockpile or an in-house government IT capability that could roll out a test and trace program? I think those are very vital questions right now. Um, when will the UK government deliver on its 50 year commitment to disarm under the non-proliferation treaty? Um, why are we spending this much money on trying to keep a submarine permanently at sea if we're not certain that we're going to be able to over the next decade? And I think most vitally, how can the public exercise democratic control over a program where so much is hidden from them? So thank you so much for your interest and support for our work over the last 20 years. I very much look forward to looking into these issues further and. Uh, I hope you'll join us. Thank you very much, David. Uh, really uh, amazing overview of the range of work you do uh, in, a, in a short time frame, and a really fantastic reminder about how important it is that people know and understand the decision making that goes into these technologies. It matters in in terms of the destructive capability of the of the of the weapons systems. It matters in terms of the usability, and it matters in terms of whether the UK can even do what they're claiming they can do um, and the extent to which uh, US uh, resources are, are, uh, are, are called on. Um, so thank you very much. I noticed we've got questions coming in via the Q&A panel and some notes coming in via the chat. So thank you very much to the audience for that. Please do keep on submitting them. I'm gonna be monitoring the questions and feeding them to the panelists at the end of all the talks. Uh, and for now, I'm going to hand over to our second speaker, Jonathan Porritt. Um, who's been an environmental campaigner for 45 years and throughout this time he's been involved in anti-nuclear campaigning as well. Um, I, I, could, I could name any number of things that he's been involved in to be honest but I'm just cherry picking a couple. Um, he was director of Friends of the Earth from 1984 to 1991. He co-founded the Forum for the Future in 1996 and he was chair of the UK Sustainable Development Commission between 2000 and 2009. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, it's, it's great to have you here. Henrietta, thank you very much. Um, and delighted to be taking part in this, not least as a very active supporter of NIS and um, a long standing member of CND as well as all the other things. So I feel lots of different elements are coming together in this uh, particular session. I want to just touch on something that David was talking about there, which is the likely pressure on the public finances over the course of the next few years, basically, and however long it takes us to pay down some of the incredible costs associated with COVID-19. And in that context, of course, the costs associated with the renewal of the Trident program and maintenance of our uh, nuclear capability in that regard is going to be subject to much greater scrutiny. And I think that is um, going to be a really critical dimension. And one has to hope that that will lead to a much higher profile for these issues in the media as people begin to understand the massive drain on the public finances that is associated at the moment with seeking to retain that uh, independent, notionally independent uh, nuclear defense capability. Um, and therefore, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle, which is the lengths to which the defense establishment now would appear to be going in order to mask some of the, of the aspects of the costs of that program. And in that regard, to make the links, which are of course very well established historically between nuclear weapons 
and civil nuclear energy. Um, I say very well established historically because, of course, there's no dispute about that historical record, the degree to which our nuclear energy program here in the UK is a byproduct, if you like, of our determination to become a nuclear power. Um, after the Second World War. And those two things now are inextricably linked in the record and nobody disputes that. But of course, at a certain point, it was more and more uncomfortable for the nuclear energy industry at that time, although it was of course then still part of government, to be associated with a nuclear weapons program, to be associated with the degree to which the UK was a nuclear power in that regard. And bit by bit, therefore, significant efforts were made to conceal or to mask the degree of interdependencies between the civil capability and the military capability. And that was done very effectively over many years, so that the denials that were issued at that point were constant and to a certain extent people began uh, no longer to raise those issues. And it's really only in the last uh, few years, I would suggest that people are beginning to open up again to this whole question about what these links actually amount to and the implication of those links, both from a nuclear weapons capability and from the nuclear energy program here in the UK. Uh, this happens to be an issue of significant personal concern to me. I was chair of the Sustainable Development Commission um, from the year 2000 through to 2009, during Tony Blair's uh, time as Prime Minister. And the Sustainable Development Commission was very involved in the 2003 Energy White Paper, which was an extremely significant milestone in energy policy in the UK, because essentially it said that nuclear power should be kicked into the long grass, that the future energy needs of the UK should no longer be dependent on nuclear power, and that we should seek increasingly to diversify through improved efficiency, through renewables and so on. There was a lot of what turned out to be premature celebration at that time, in that I think we honestly all thought that that was the end of nuclear power. Lo and behold, of course, a couple of years later in 2005, Tony Blair suddenly announced that there would be a new review of energy strategy, he gave a very upbeat speech to the CBI saying that he wanted to bring back those energy considerations with a vengeance. And hey presto, in May 2006, the Labour Party confirmed that it would again rely on nuclear power as a very significant net contributor to the energy needs of this country. Now, this was completely baffling to everybody involved in the nuclear power sector at that time. Nobody could understand how this change of heart had happened. None of the external circumstances had changed at all. There was literally not one germane relevant factor that was any different in 2006 from what had obtained in 2003 at the energy at the time of the energy white paper. So inevitably people began to unearth the degree to which Tony Blair personally and of course that strong pro-nuclear faction inside the Labour Party were subject to a lot of lobbying from the nuclear weapons establishment here in the UK to persuade a then Labour Prime Minister that it would be crucial to maintain a nuclear power program in order to provide additional resource in the uh, provision of nuclear skills for the future. And this is not a conspiracy theory by any stretch of the imagination, because if you look at our energy policy today with its dependence on nuclear power, there is, there is literally no other explanation as to why we would be so gung-ho about nuclear power today. No other nation is intent, uh, in Europe is intent on maintaining a nuclear power uh, capability of this kind. Um, we all know the costs are massively out of control. We all know that they're far more expensive in terms of generating the energy that we need. Bayes, the government department, acknowledges this. The National Audit Office has been outstandingly critical in all of those different issues. We know that it, nuclear power is not an effective way of accelerating CO2 abatement, of supporting the UK on its decarbonisation story. EDF was unwise enough to admit the other day that it would take 20 years of 
Sizewell C being in operation before it paid back its full carbon footprint. So we wouldn't really be getting any benefits at all from that in terms of uh, CO2 abatement. And we also know that this old story that we have to have nuclear as base load in order to maintain grid security, the national grid has, has pretty much put pay to that as an argument. So there isn't really any residual reason why a government would stubbornly continue with a policy that is going to cost the consumers of this country a lot of money, an enormous amount of money over time, has in itself raised highly significant security issues, because as you will know, Hinkley C at the moment is only being built with the very significant support of the Chinese nuclear industry. Sizewell, coming after Hinkley, if it gets approval, would be in a similar situation. And Bradwell, were we to push ahead with that proposal, would be a 100% nuclear um, facility owned, built and owned by the Chinese. So there are just too many mysteries associated with why we've got nuclear power any longer in this country until you begin to think through the degree to which there is a concerted effort continuing to be made to mask some of the otherwise insupportable costs associated with the Trident program and the renewal of the Trident program through the civil arm of the nuclear industry. This case has been strengthened recently by a concerted effort now to bring forward plans for small modular reactors as they're known. Um, there is now a big battle going on inside government as to whether we should be, whether the government should be putting money into size or C or whether it should be putting money into small uh, modular reactors. That is the option much supported by Dominic Cummings. And of course, were that to be the case, it would strengthen the argument that this is really as much about the nuclear weapons side of things as about nuclear energy because much of that money would then be filtered through Rolls-Royce. And that is where a lot of these nuclear skills would be uh, maintained. Now, much of this analysis has been done over the last few years um, with incredible persistence and forensic determination um, by Phil Johnston and Andy Sterling at Sussex University. And I would urge anybody who wants to understand more about the ways in which this heist has been perpetrated to dig into their research work. It's on the, their websites and it is a, it's a brilliant piece of work. And the interesting thing for a lot of people now is that the defense side of things, they're not really denying this. There isn't any attempt any longer to pretend that this isn't what's going on. But from the government perspective, there is still total secrecy associated with that. And I just want to end with this quote from Andy Sterling who kind of summed this up. So he says, by means of levels of secrecy that are of course routine, in nuclear defense issues, a military industrial base that would be simply unaffordable in the absence of new nuclear construction can therefore be maintained without increasingly awkward public scrutiny outside of the defense budget and entirely off the public books. And that is the situation that we're in at the moment. And it is truly disgraceful. And the more light that we can shed on that continuing effort to park a substantial part of the total cost under the civil side of things, the better it'll be. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Jonathan. A really uh, fantastic overview uh, of this sense that you can't take statements about government decisions on nuclear uh, matters at face value. There are other things going on and it takes the dogged research of Phil Johnson, Andy Sterling, and uh, people at NIS and similar to, to really uncover these things and people need to pay attention to them. Uh, so thank you. I also have to say you're preempting a lot of the questions that I've had in already, so that's great. We'll extend the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Alamade Samuel, who is a senior teaching fellow at SOAS, the University of London. Um, and alongside his teaching, uh, he researches nuclear weapons Dis and disarmament options and strategies among multiple different frameworks and he's uh, really prominent in supporting student advocacy projects. Thank you very much Ola. Thank you very much Henrietta. Um, I would like to thank the Nuclear Information Service for their invitation to speak today um, alongside such a distinguished panel. 
For the past 20 years, the NIS has informed, influenced, and encouraged initiatives towards the verifiable disarmament of British nuclear weapons. And I would like to congratulate them on this 20th anniversary milestone. Today, I'll be speaking about the future of advocacy in nuclear disarmament, looking forward to the next 20 years. So I was watching Erica Gregory's TED talk on YouTube the other day, titled, the world doesn't need more nuclear weapons. It was an inspiring and creative call to action. Erica was communicating directly to Generation Possible, explaining the dangers of nuclear weapons, but also highlighting the uniqueness of Generation Possible and the resources available to them to implement change. Change that will presumably lead to nuclear disarmament in 2045. Generation Possible, in her estimation, includes those that were born in and after the year 1991, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. By this estimation, I am part of Generation Possible, and many of her remarks, I think, were incredibly important for Generation Possible to internalize and act upon. Consequently, I decided to scroll through the comment section to see what the rest of Generation Possible thought of her remarks. Now, aside from the numerous trolls dropping hateful comments and random emojis in the comments section, there are quite a number of people who seemed genuinely concerned about the threat of nuclear warfare. Interestingly, among those concerned, many of them simply could not see how nuclear disarmament could ever be achieved. Some comments called them superweapons. Others claim that nuclear weapons have, so far, saved us from World War III. But a cross-cutting theme in the comment section was that nuclear weapons, these weapons with the potential to extinguish all life on Earth as we know it, these weapons are normal. My generation, physically and mentally, are enslaved by nuclear weapons. I don't need to talk about the physical threat of nuclear weapons here as distinguished members of the panel have and will discuss this in more detail. However, my generation is mentally enslaved by nuclear weapons in the most interesting ways. We don't seem to have the same fear of these weapons. We haven't experienced or heard about a world order without nuclear weapons. And so we struggle to imagine what a future without these weapons might look like. Our collective imagination is enslaved by the existence of nuclear weapons. Today, our world is facing a number of severe crises which make nuclear use more likely and requires us to take nuclear disarmament more seriously. Earlier this year, the doomsday clock was set at 100 seconds to midnight, closer than ever to catastrophe, even if we include the height of tensions during the Cold War. So there's a paradox where we live in times of heightened danger of nuclear extinction, but also in a time where this danger is routinely ignored, forgotten even, by the majority of the young population. In my experience, compared to other causes, it is very difficult to mobilize generation possible. It is difficult to even interest them when other activities, consumables, and problems are competing for attention. The lessons learned by older generations are struggling to trickle down into the consciousness of the younger generation. So I'm left thinking, what would this mean for the future of advocacy for nuclear disarmament? On one hand, I, can think, I can't think of a single nuclear weapon state that has shown any serious signs of willingness to give up these weapons. These weapons are thought to provide status prestige and deterrence capability. There is still no progress on the negotiation of a fissile material cut-up treaty, an important element for a world without nuclear weapons. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT, which was adopted in response to political concerns and public pressure on the issue of nuclear testing has not yet entered into force. See, I was three years old when it opened for signature, but I'm here talking about the pending ratifications from key states. More recently, we have been watching a dangerous military situation unfold, 
Driven most alarmingly by the US, we have seen a withdrawal from important nuclear reduction and control treaties, and we have heard about the possible resumption of nuclear testing. We have also seen the introduction of so-called usable nuclear weapons. Now, considering all these developments together, it shows just how disturbing the situation really is and how important it is for us to double our efforts towards a nuclear weapons free world. I still remain optimistic regardless uh, because there are disarmament opportunities within reach. Instead of waiting on nuclear weapon states for the so-called conducive environment for nuclear disarmament, the world negotiated a treaty which comprehensively bans nuclear weapons. We are only three ratifications away from the entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and this is a welcome development. It shows courageous leadership from those that champion the treaty. It also shows the rise of information technology, which has eased high-speed communication around the globe, allowing for individuals and groups to connect and to coordinate advocacy globally. The reach and influence of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, amongst others, is evidence of this relatively new form of power. Non-nuclear weapon states and civil society will continue to bring pressure to bear on nuclear weapon states, bilaterally and multilaterally, at the 2021 NPT Review Conference in the UN and also in domestic politics, because collective pressure is harder to ignore than bilateral pressure. I understand that without the participation of nuclear weapon states, the ban treaty would have limited effect. But the important thing is that the treaty clearly outlaws nuclear weapons. After its entry into force, legal speculation will not be able to justify the threat of the use of nuclear weapons by anyone. We will see a crystallization of norms against nuclear weapons possession. And these norms would increasingly, af increasingly affect the thinking of people around the world as they become concerned about the loss of traditional arms control agreements, the illegal development of new weapons and new arms races. Now, don't get me wrong, the NPT would remain the cornerstone of non-proliferation and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. I don't think we would see a mass exit of states from the treaty anytime soon. But without change, this treaty would likely suffer a slower but equally painful death. Lower ranked officials will come and give routine speeches at NPT meetings, but with little movement, um, because nothing necessarily would happen because states don't prioritize the treaty. In many ways, it might resemble the UN Conference on Disarmament, which has not completed a treaty in more than 20 years. The gulf between nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament efforts, um, I think, will widen as the NPT loses relevance in disarmament affairs. But I also predict that a number of states and civil society organizations will aim to fill this gulf until a serious disarmament commitment is demonstrated by nuclear weapon states. See, as citizens around the world begin to internalize this norm against nuclear weapons possession, Champions of the Ban Treaty will capitalize on this, and these champions have made it clear that they're not going anywhere. Therefore, beginning a process of greatly reducing the number of nuclear weapons would be much easier for those nuclear weapon states who recognize the illegality of their possession and the hostility of public opinion towards this we these weapons. Also, nuclear sharing or nuclear weapon sharing, I think, will become a historical relic over the next two decades, at least in Europe. My prediction for the next 20 years is that we'll be entering an era of mediators and go-betweens, um, actors who would strive to maintain strategic partnerships with nuclear weapon states and good relations with other nations around the world to help br build bridges and close the gaps in positions on many critical issues. Um, at this point, I'll pause here. Uh, thank you very much, Henriette. Uh, Ola, thank you very much. Um, you've given us a really clear overview of the importance of all of this work. 
the very clear evidence that, that, that we have problems and continued dangers that actually are increasing, that the treaty regimes that we have got are deteriorating in different dimensions. Uh, uh, and at the same time, nuclear weapons uh, states not only are not fulfilling their Article 6 disarmament commitments under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, they're all, they're all modernising their arsenals, uh, in, uh, reflecting uh, David's comments too. I'm glad that you gave us some rays of hope there, <laughs> that, that you see some possibilities for disarmament in the future, you see some possibilities of mobilising advocacy work still further, despite the uh, competing attention draws uh, from other from other areas. Uh, so thank you very very much. Um, I understand that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is in the room, but he hasn't logged on uh, in his own name. Um, so I'm just going to see uh, if 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 he can join now, um, or if I'm going to move straight to Kate Hudson. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, can you um, can you join the room yet? Uh, well, for a few minutes, I'll just I'll just uh, reflect a bit more on the sort of thing that Ola was talking about. Um, Ola um, is a coordinator for uh, a project, a student advocacy project based at SOAS. Uh, it's called the Scrap Weapons Project, um, which mobilizes students at Zo SOAS to be thinking about general and complete disarmament and how that might work. Um, uh, internationally. So uh, it's a really exciting project for students, you know, they get to see how international treaty making really happens. They're looking at treaties that have worked in the past that people have signed up to and thinking about how these lessons learned could be applied. Um, I am aware, Ola, that uh, this, is, this is one project uh, in one university in London, um, and at the same time, the youth of the world are being asked to solve a lot of problems. <laughs> so that there's a sense uh, that, they're, that they're expected to solve uh, climate change. So while we're, we're waiting for Jeremy to maybe connect, I'm going to ask Ola if you might reflect on your students uh, at the Scrap Project, if, if they feel torn between different priorities or if they see them um, as integrated holes, if, if, if people who are interested in nuclear disarmament tend to be stuck in nuclear disarmament or if they see it as an integrated matter in the sort of way that Jonathan Porritt was outlining. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question, Henrietta. Um, I think what I've observed over time working with the SCRAP project and working with a lot of um, young advocates like myself, um, we don't have a shortage of problems uh, to think about whether it's climate change or you know, nuclear weapons or even the misuse of conventional weapons by states all over the world, uh, especially more recently in the global south, um, my home country of Nigeria, um, we're actively fighting to ban a, a portion of our police force, which is called the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, which essentially have been um, engaged in the killing um, and robbery of a lot of young Nigerians. Um, so we have a lot of problems to solve, um, and a lot of these problems were inherited, and we're expected to come up with the creative solutions um, that would work to solve these problems. Um, and while at times it might feel overwhelming to think about you know, the future of the world in, in just 20 years, um, what I see is that there is passionate energy from a lot of youth advocates around the world. Um, at Scrap, we routinely have um, so synergy meetings between advocates from completely, you know, seemingly unrelated fields. Um, there's lots of overlap between the climate movement and the nuclear weapons ban movement, for example. Um, there's lots of overlap between uh, the advocates for the equal treatment of refugees in, in Europe and nuclear disarmament advocates that highlight the historical uh, remnants of nuclear imperialism and colonialism. Um, and so what I'm seeing is a, is a development of dynamic and interesting, diverse advocates that know how to find the synergies between these movements um, and can leverage the benefits of collective action. Um, and I think it is important for advocates in the future to have these qualities. Um, Another instance I'm seeing is that 
you know, part of, I spoke earlier about our generation normalizing nuclear weapons in their collective consciousness. And part of this is because of how nuclear weapons have been normalized in popular media and also in social media. We play video games that normalize nuclear weapons. We've watched some movies um, wherein it's, it's joked about, it's seen as a distant reality. But we also have, you know, the impact of social media and public popular media is that they are very interesting uh, um, enterprises that you know, aggressively vie for our generation's attention. And so when you're pushing for something like nuclear disarmament, which is already hard to imagine, the threat is really hard to envision, we have to find creative solutions that can better capture the attention of the younger generation and motivate them to take proactive action. And we're seeing, you know, projects that are involved in the arts and the sciences and, you know, even game developers, um, you know, I'm referring to N-Square collaboration in the US, where they try to find, you know, seemingly unrelated uh, uh, expertise and bring them together towards uh, a meaningful goal. So I think over the next coming years, we'll see much more innovative ways um, of performing advocacy. And I don't think there'll be um, a reduction in, in our collective energy and passion um, to secure our future, essentially. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. That was really exciting. You know, it's a really, uh, uh, really nice uh, insight into how how you work and and the things that you see emerging uh from from different students and your own work as well uh uh yes and good luck with carrying on with that you know you've clearly lots to do yeah um so Thank i you. understand that jeremy corbyn's having uh difficulty logging on so i am going to uh move to kate uh i hope that's not putting you on the spot kate i know that's you're expecting so. <laughs> <That's so. laughs> last uh, thank you, Kate. So just to uh, introduce you, um, Kate Hudson, if you need any introduction, that is. <laughs> She's a, a, a disarmament activist and academic, uh, formerly head of social and policy studies at the London South Bank University, um, and has combined high level academia with campaigning on a variety of fronts. Uh, so I know her best for her work with the campaign for nuclear disarmament. She was the chair of that between 2003 and 2010, and now she's general secretary. She's also been involved in the Stop the War Coalition. So thank you very much, Kate. Yeah. Thanks very much, Henrietta. Of course, I want to start off by congratulating Nuclear Information Service on your 20th anniversary. We really hugely value the work that you do, uh, your rigorous approach, which I would like to describe as both scholarly and accessible. That's not always easy to achieve, but you do that so well. Um, and we also thank you for your cooperative approach and your invaluable participation in the No Trident Replacement core group. So big thank you to all of you, really. Uh, so uh, in terms of global threats, which was my brief, we are living in a time of multiple and interlocking crises and increasing global threats. Um, the scale of the threats are shown, thrown sharply into relief by the decision of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists to set the hands of the doomsday clock at 100, 100 seconds to midnight. That's the closest ever, as Dr. Samuel has uh, just mentioned. The two great existential threats which they identify are nuclear war and climate change. Uh, and I would say that both of these are increased and exacerbated by the policies of the current US president. But of course, he's not alone in pursuing policies which would have been unthinkable even in recent years. And of course, we need to recognize that the perspective of our own government also needs to change if we are to save our planet from total catastrophe. So we're coming up to the next US presidential election in just a few weeks time. And I think it's timely to assess how President Trump's policies and his strategic approach have contributed to this increasingly dangerous scenario. Perhaps of chief concern in terms of the danger of nuclear war is Trump's increasingly hostile attitude to China there was a very interesting editorial in the Financial Times just a few days.
days ago about um, what they describe as the kind of new Cold War, developing new Cold War. China, of course, is still a developing country. It's emerged as a great economic powerhouse, but it has been identified by the US leadership as a kind of increasing, let's say, rival for some time. And in the Obama years, of course, US policy oriented increasingly towards the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the so-called pivot to Asia, I think, was the term which Hillary Clinton used when she was Secretary of State at that time. Uh, but this pivot has accelerated and become more hostile since President Trump's election. And policy documents indicate a shift from what you might describe as a containment approach towards one more of confrontation. For example, in 2018, the National Defense Strategy identified the central challenge to US prosperity and security as the re-emergence of long-term strategic competition by China and Russia. And in this document, um, the US administration described them as revisionist powers that want to shape a world consistent with their authoritarian model. Uh, there was no consideration, of course, of the impact that continual expansion of NATO for almost 30 years now and its military alliances too have had on such countries and their own policies. So the US goal is to be able to defeat those countries militarily and to prepare for war on a massive scale. And Trump's policies repeatedly articulate the mantra of compete, deter, and win. And indeed, the emphasis across US strategies is on lethality, fighting, and winning wars. But there have been some developments in how those wars are conceived of. So they're no longer seen as just wars on land, on sea, and in the air. Uh, for over 20 years, the US vision has been one of full spectrum dominance over land, sea, air and space. And most recently, information and cyberspace have been added to that too. Trump has ramped up the militarization of space as well as its commercialization, of course, which is a, a big theme too. Last year, the US Space Force was launched and Trump said at the time that it marked a big moment and that there was going to be a lot of things happening in space because space is the world's newest war fighting domain. I mean, terribly disturbing. And of course, last year it was Keep Space for Peace Week. So there are many activists and campaigners who are trying to you know, roll back and prevent this kind of seeing of space as a war fighting domain, but it's a very, very strong agenda, this new generation of space weapons, kind of revisiting Reagan's Star Wars. Some of, some of us may remember that from the 1980s. That's now on the cards. And of course, to these arenas, we can add the terrain of fake news, anti-science, lies and misinformation. And of course, these are things which were again touched on by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists when they made their prediction for the doomsday clock. Trump's policies usually assert the old perspective that the US is standing up for freedom and the rules-based international order, uh, whereas he says that his competitors strive to undermine that. But in fact, I would say that no country has done as much to undermine international legal structures as the US under Trump. I can name a few, I'm sure we can all think of many. He's withdrawn from the Climate Accords and the World Health Organization. He's trashed a whole range of arms control treaties and raised the possibility of the resumption of nuclear testing. He's withdrawn from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Iran nuclear deal, the Open Skies Treaty, and is at risk of demolishing the Outer Space Treaty and the New START Treaty, that's the Bilateral Reductions Treaty between the US and Russia signed by Obama and Medvedev that's reduced um, the, the nuclear arsenals of those two countries. 
So, of course, all these actions increase the risk of nuclear war. And we understand the context for this. Many fine books have been written uh, explaining why you know, the US is a declining power economically and it seeks to assert itself militarily. And this isn't new. It's been the case for some time. Again, those of us who've been around and active for a little while will think immediately of the Bush administration. Uh, where President Bush sought to compel non-compliant states to bend to US will, unleashing the so-called war on terror in advance of the neocon project for a new American century. Remember that? Just before the war on Iraq. Um, but I would say that Trump's drive to war is far more dangerous than that, terrible though that was, particularly for the Middle Eastern region. While Trump's national security strategy um, focused on potential war with China and Russia, his nuclear posture review was a massive escalation of nuclear risk. And essentially, it took the lid off the restraints on both new build and nuclear weapons use. And there was commitment to a whole new generation of so-called usable nuclear weapons, and an increase in the number of scenarios in which nuclear weapons could be used. And of course, we all know that previously the case had always been uh, made that nuclear weapons weren't actually intended for use, uh, that they were intended to deter, but now use is part of the policy. And it's not just Trumpian rhetoric. We can't just dismiss it as, oh, he, he says those things. Um, these new usable nuclear weapons have now been produced and they have been deployed. So taking these two strategies together, it's clear that there is significant danger of a US war on China in which nuclear weapons could be used. And I would say, um, alongside many other uh, peace campaigns and organizations that opposing this is a fundamental task for our movement today. And I'm pleased to say that CND is working to promote peace and dialogue, to work with all our strength to prevent such a war. Because if conflict comes between two nuclear armed states, the future of the whole world will be put in doubt. So this is a time when we need maximum global cooperation to deal with the huge challenges we face today. Climate catastrophe, pandemics, racist discrimination, economic crisis, all countries need to work together. And where there are differences, they must be dealt with through the appropriate international bodies. The imminent ratification of the Treaty on the Pro Prohibition of nuclear weapons shows the powerful international cooperation that exists for nuclear abolition. And we must build on this too in other areas. So to conclude, Henrietta, we look forward to continuing to work with NIS and other organizations who share our goal of a world of peace and justice free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate, and I'm glad you finished on that note because the lead up uh, to to that final message of hope was was terribly gloomy, you know, and, and, and appropriately so. There's there's so many problems facing us, and not only is the problem of nuclear weapons not adequately been addressed yet at an international international level, it's it's increasing, and there are more risks uh, to to join it. So thank you uh, for reminding us that there are things that can be done about that. Yeah, great. So now uh, I'm sure we've all noticed Jeremy Corbyn has managed to join us, uh, uh, and I'm delighted to be able to give him an opportunity to reflect uh, on today's themes. Uh, he's been a Labour MP since 1983, and he was Labour of the lead, leader, excuse me, of the Labour Party and of the opposition between 2015 to 20. He is a long time opponent of nuclear weapons and has demonstrated this in numerous ways in his parliamentary work and this is his support for CND. And he's also attended many of the international meetings of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, including its preparatory commissions and its review conferences. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Really happy uh, that you're able to be with us. 
Thank you very much, Henrietta. In fact, I've heard pretty well all of it so far. I think there was a slight confusion over the link up, but never mind. We, we are here now, which is good. First of all, huge congratulations on the 20th anniversary. It's an amazing achievement and you've done incredible work for a very long time. And I think I couldn't have put it better than the way Kate did, that you've managed to bring together Um, oh dear, so this is now seems to have frozen. Um, uh, the intellectual, and I think that is absolutely. I was a bit late uh, to the. How is that now? Uh, you seem to have caught up, so yes, carry on. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I've been a member of CND since I was in my teens and still am and very proud to be a, a member of CND because the fundamental argument has always been of the immorality of nuclear weapons that are weapons of mass destruction that can only be indiscriminate in their effect and their usage. And uh, whilst we commemorate Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of every year, it, the reality is those incredibly expensive weapons for the time, and they were incredibly expensive, um, were indiscriminate in killing hundreds of thousands of people who bore no responsibility whatsoever for what um, was happening in the Second World War. But they set off the nuclear arms race, which we've all lived with and experienced ever since. And so I think one should never leave the moral case against nuclear weapons out of the equation because it's too easy often to get into all kinds of um, scenario planning about what may or may not happen and leave out the sheer horror and enormity of what nuclear weapons actually are. The opportunities now to uh, do something about it are actually very considerable. In Britain, as we do after every general election, we have a strategic defence and security review, and that is being undertaken by parliamentary committees at the moment. And anyone that looks at the strategic needs of any country now, you would look at issues of poverty, you would look at issues of environmental disaster. You would look at issues of trade, you'd look at issues of refugees, you'd look at many, many issues. On top of that, the whole world would now look at the effect of the coronavirus on national economies, on the global economy, and so on. You'd also look at the um, various terrorist incidents that have happened over the past few months and years. And then you'd factor into it and say, well, hang on a minute, how do nuclear weapons deal with any of these issues? Were nuclear weapons any use to the USA on um, September the 11th, 2001, uh, any more than anyone else that suffered a horrible attack like that? And so you have to ask yourself the question, why are we pursuing, apparently, yet another generation of nuclear weapons? The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was an enormous step forward, no question about that. And whilst it is much ignored and denigrated by the declared nuclear weapon states, the reality is the vast majority of the world states support the NPT, have abided by the NPT, and indeed the UN General Assembly has voted overwhelmingly for a nuclear weapons free world in the future. Um, I think this is an opportunity such as there's not been for a very long time in order to capture the public imagination on this. Jonathan was pointing out quite rightly that uh, every government has put itself into much greater debt as a result of having to deal with the corona crisis. Um, that means that most economies and most governments are running at a big spending deficit at the moment. And the only way forward then is to invest in a sustainable economy for the future. The needs are absolutely there for investment in green energy, green technologies, improved biodiversity um, and different and better farming methods. 
The needs are also there to recognize that the economic inequalities around the world, as well as the illegal wars of the last few years, have fed the refugee flow, which is now probably somewhere around 70 million people around the world, more than ever in recorded history, who are people without a place to call their own. They're human beings just like all of us and they want somewhere to live and they wanna be able to make their contribution during their lifetime. So I think this is an opportunity to um, campaign very strongly on this. And the delay of the NPT review conference because of Corona might be a bit of a blessing in disguise because it gives us more time and more chance to get a global movement going to put pressure on that conference because I the danger is that we've all been involved in this for a very long time you become almost institutionalized into um, going to these conferences and opposing these things without any real expectation of change I hope this time we can mobilize global opinion on the on the issues that we all face this is the year when Global temperatures have risen the most. There's been more forest fires uh, than anywhere else, any time else. There's now significant melting of the permafrost in northern Russia, just as much as there's extremely high temperatures in other parts of the world, and obviously melting of the polar ice caps as well as increased numbers of uh, really extreme weather patterns all over the world. Surely, if that's not a warning, I don't know what is. The levels of pollution, which aren't necessarily the same thing, um, of seas, rivers and air around the world are incredibly high and getting much worse. But again, this is a sort of perverse thing that's come out of the corona crisis. For people living in New Delhi, for the first time, they saw the beauty of the uh, historic centre of their city. Why for the first time? Because the first time in the lifetime of many people, the air has been clear enough to see across the city, to see the mountains in the distance and so on. So people have had some view of how we could do things very, very differently in the world. But my concern is that there's a whole generation that have grown up with the um, vague knowledge at the back of their minds that nuclear weapons exist. They don't really know what they are. They do not fully appreciate the destructive power of them. And as far as they're concerned, it's just a, another debate about weaponry. And I think we have to be much blunter in explaining what a nuclear weapon is and what it does. Because at the, as we're doing that, the USA and China are both increasing nuclear capacity, Russia apparently doing the same, and Britain in a rather convoluted way is developing um, fewer new warheads with greater destructive capability, as was outlined at the beginning of our webinar uh, this afternoon. Um, This is the chance when Britain could lead the way in priorities our um, living standards and our contribution to the world's environmental issues. But we have to be out there doing that. Jonathan also quite rightly raised the issues of the connection between civil nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And I remember discussing this at great length with Tony Benn, who was explaining his former energy secretary and very important figure in the Labour Party until he died. Um, about the connection and the very high cost of nuclear power, which was born in the 50s and 60s particularly, as a way of providing the basis for um, nuclear, um, nuclear warheads, I suppose. Um, and this then feeds into a debate about the environment. As far as I'm concerned, we should be developing um, renewable energy, wind, wave, solar, um, geothermal and so on. Um, there has to be a base production of energy by some form because obviously solar and wind is slightly variable but that I believe can be achieved and my whole strategy would be to emphasize much more on renewable on renewable energy and whilst there is the development going ahead of Hinkley Point at the present time I think all the other nuclear power stations proposed in Britain are very much in the balance as indeed nuclear energy is in the balance all around the world you only have to read the Financial Times at weekends to realize that um, the 
those that have invested in nuclear energy in the past are very skeptical of it at the moment. And the last point to make is this, that the NPT has achieved nuclear weapons free zones, um, has helped with that in Latin America, in parts of Asia and in Africa, of course. Um, it has not yet managed to persuade India and Pakistan to um, disarm or not to or to agree on non-use or, or some steps towards that and because of the way in which the Trump administration has undermined the um, Iran nuclear agreement there is a grave danger that um, Iran will end up going back into the potential development of at least the um, development of a nuclear weapon facility and that of course will then lead to extensive rearmament in the region. Every NPT review conference I've been to has said it believes in a Middle East of weapons, uh, Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone and that surely is something that we should ensure comes back to the next NPT. The danger of the rhetoric building up between the USA and China and um, military arguments about the South China Sea, the growth of US bases in Australia and elsewhere is extremely dangerous. On the other side of it, the huge economic um, interdependence between the USA and China leads me to think that uh, uh, both sides will pull back at some point. The difference between that and the Cold War with the Soviet Union was the Cold War with the Soviet Union did not have the same degree of economic interrelation and interdependence that China has with the USA and with the rest of the world. But we have to mobilize people, give them hope that things can be done differently, but also quite bluntly say, why should we be spending all this money on weapons of mass destruction when the corona crisis have shown the most pressing need in the world is health service for all and environmental sustainability to protect our planet for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, another fantastic, rich uh, talk. I'm, I'm really struck by the overlaps between these talks, um, which maybe could have been anticipated given the themes. Nevertheless, uh, I've learned a lot from them. I think time and time again through the talks, there's been a sense um, that we don't un always understand the decisions uh, that are being made or how we don't, we don't always have access to the decisions uh, and what's really steering some of these things. We've uh, heard uh, about how expensive the UK's nuclear weapons are and how there are other risks that that money could be better spent on. And also through the talks, there's been a sense about what, what advocacy is possible, what advocacy is happening, and how to mobilise that to, to uh, make uh, even more impact uh, on, on the world. So we've got a stack of questions. Thank you very much to everybody. Um, and we've got about uh, 20 minutes left of the webinar. So what I've done is I've divided the uh, questions into uh, four rough themes. Um, the first being the mechanics of the UK's, uh, UK, the UK's infrastructures and decision making. Um, so I'm going to put these to all of you at once. I don't know if you've got a pen and you can be jotting them down and then give you uh, each a chance to reflect on a set of questions rather than one at a time, because I think that's more efficient. So our first question came in ahead of time from Phil Johnston from Sussex University, who Jonathan Porritt uh, invokes this work already. Um, so uh, they've been, uh, Phil Johnston, along with Andy Sterling at Sussex University, have been researching the civil military links um, between the submarine industry and the civil nuclear new build here in the UK. Um, they've had a lot of interactions with policymakers about this, and in particular, they had uh, interactions with influential figures in the Labour Party. Um, but despite having clearly ex explained the dynamics, it felt as though they're being stopped at some point uh, in, in getting the information through to the people that could make decisions on it. So a question specifically to Jeremy is um, if, if you could shed any light on whether there are pressures on the Labour Party not to consider these sorts of things um, or to the rest of the panel, um, if you've got any insight into the challenges people in Britain face on getting these sorts of issues aired by political parties. So that's uh, question one, number one on, on different mechanics of the UK's infrastructures 
We also had a number of questions from Mike Keeley on these sorts of mechanics sorts of questions or, or questions. He asked quite simply, maybe this is most appropriate to you, David, um, why uh, is a new warhead being considered and why is continuous at sea deterrence uh, continuing? Um, and how are the links with the civil military program, sorry, the civil program being maintained when there's clear evidence of links between the US and the UK militaries? So that's quite a lot of quite big questions <laughs> to work through in the first instance. I'm going to see if Jeremy could start us off, please, um, because the first question was, was had a clear steer to you. Yeah, well, thanks, Phil. Thanks for your question. And um, thanks for the work that, that you do. Um, I am acutely aware of uh, political, economic, and uh, military pressures that are put on decision makers and in parliament and there is a huge continuous very conventional line of arguments about um, strategic defense that flows through in parliament and um, it's regurgitated all the time by the ministry of defense and um, anyone that goes away from that um, is seen to be very deviant in some way. Shami Chakrabarti and I worked very hard during my period as leader of the party to develop a um, war powers bill which would become a war powers act which would mean that the uh, power of the prime minister to uh, go to war by the use of the royal prerogative would be ended instead there would have to be specific parliamentary uh, approval for it and we worked very hard on that and I was um, very keen to develop a different narrative surrounding defence expenditure and nuclear weapons. There are two huge stumbling blocks that come across anyone trying to do this, um, as I'm sure everyone on this call would recognise. The first one is the question about jobs and security and the huge um, expenditure on, through and by uh, British arms manufacturers to manufacture arms uh, in Britain, to sell elsewhere, to manufacture planes to be used as warplanes elsewhere, and also to develop uh, nuclear vessels, nuclear submarines and so on, nuclear powered vessels, as well as um, nuclear weapons issues. The biggest uh, rebellion that happened during my time as leader of the party was, wait for it, when I proposed a motion to Parliament that we end arms sales to Saudi Arabia because of their bombardment of Yemen. The biggest opposition I had in Parliament was on that. Um, all framed around the issue of jobs for those working for BAE systems that um, develop those um, and deliver those weapons to Yemen. And um, I was and still am developing work on alternative jobs and also on guaranteeing jobs in manufacturing industry whilst we begin to um, redefine the purpose of manufacturing um, industry in Britain, which I do think has to be done because um, it's, there's not much point in complaining about um, the use of British weapons by Saudi Arabia um, in bombing the Yemen unless you're actually prepared to do something about it. And that means taking the fear of job loss away from those that manufacture those weapons by investing in that skill set of shipbuilding, of aircraft and manufacturing capability to achieve something very, very different. The second one is the um, way in which the um, military think tanks and the Ministry of Defence spend a huge amount of time trying to influence members of parliament into believing that there is an immediate strategic threat um, to Britain from usually from Russia or from um, uh, other, other states. Now, I think the buildup of troops on both sides of the border between um, Russia and the states of Central Europe is serious and dangerous. The only way you get around that is by um, reducing tensions, um, is by dialogue, and also being quite robust about human rights abuses with any country with which you deal. And uh, I do not 
approve, support or condone human rights abuses by any state, by any government at any, uh, uh, in, in any part of the world. And I think you have to be universal and consistent on that. But the pressures are on policymakers to believe that the only way of dealing with the threat um, um, or perceived threat of Russia or China is to develop our own nuclear weapons. The reality is that Britain's nuclear weapons are not that many. Uh, the USA has far more and basically Britain is in a, a nuclear umbrella with the United States. It is a question of changing that thinking and that means that uh, the imagination of millions of young people in Europe, the USA and other parts of the world that have been raised by their support for Black Lives Matters as a recognition of what injustice looks like, have been raised by their concerns about environmental destruction, need also to be raised about their, the, the issues of the danger of war and peace. Otherwise, the danger by accident of tipping over into a military conflict with China, which could become a nuclear one um, later on. Now, obviously, nobody on this call wants that to happen, but you have to do something about it by reducing tensions and increasing understanding. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's given a sense of the challenges you've faced in trying to get these things uh, addressed and, and some possible ways of thinking that through. Um, given that just time just is add very briefly to that, one thing I didn't say, and it'd be very quick because I know there's not much time. I do think we have to look at the way in in which um, the mainstream media frame all these arguments all the time. In two days, I was day one was condemned for being a danger to Britain because I'd indicated I was not prepared to use nuclear weapons. Day two, I was condemned as being a threat to Britain because I'd have my hand on the nuclear trigger. It can't be both. Right. Yes. So thank you. Yes. Another insight into uh, high political, <laughs> you know, the, the challenges that, that face people in, in political office. I want to rotate, I want to put the, the question, the same question about uh, how to get issues aired in the UK government or, or in de democratic processes. First to Jonathan, then to David, and then if it's okay with the panelists, I'm going to set up a different set of questions so that we run through some of the other issues as well, please. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm very happy to pass to colleagues on this other than to say, as Jeremy's already intimated, the level of pressure that not just parliamentarians, but uh, people involved in politics comes under from the defense establishment is is utterly astonishing it's, it's just non-stop and it is constantly there the whole time so i think um i i can only imagine what it felt like when jeremy was put under that pressure but anybody in those positions is exposed to exactly the same uh do you have any advice or thoughts about people wanting to bypass uh, the, 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 those huge hurdles, those huge other interests? I think that what I think what we're looking at is the possibility of some of the old truths about what made this country what people think it is are going to be seen very differently post COVID. I mean, the idea of us seeking to maintain it what our image was in the world in the same way as we did pre-COVID, after COVID, just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And we have to be absolutely alert to the possibility of shifting perceptions about that and the very different approaches that we're going to need to national security, which needs to look completely different, and what we need to deem to be essential investments in the um, well-being of people in this country, particularly the health service and social care. Right, thank you. Yes, so there is a sense there's all sorts of shifting structures yeah. happening right now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, David, have you got anything to add to, to the question about how to get these issues aired or also to Mike Keeley's questions about why New Hawk Warhead, why are we carrying on with uh, continuous at sea deterrence? I appreciate these are large questions. Uh, for sure, yeah. I mean, the, the, the questions if, if i could answer comprehensively then uh, perhaps our situation would be what it is and, and we would be we'd be improving uh situation in this country i mean i I've, I've spoken with with andy and phil about their work which I, I also value very highly and and about these issues to some extent and i, I would just reflect that it's, it's it's very interesting that when you posit to people this link between civil and military nuclear that uh there's a real uh uh, disparity when you know when you speak to people who are not 
within that world that it, it's it comes across to them like this is a massive conspiracy theory and it couldn't possibly be happening so we, so we get to people who, who are so closely within that world that they say yes of course this is the case this is exactly what happens and no nobody's going to talk about it because it's because no, nobody wants to 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 concede that there is this obvious overlap and yeah uh, and, and that the investment in civil nuclear is a subsidy to the nuclear weapons program on uh, coming to mike's question why, why is a new warhead being developed? Why is CASD continuing? There are lots of reasons, and some of them are bound up in, in I think, poor and unsubstantiated uh, sort of intellectual uh, frameworks around deterrence and, and what threats to the well being of people in this country are privileged and how they're conceived, and how they, it, it's imagined that they can be tackled. But I, th I think also we, we really shouldn't underestimate the fact that uh, almost a sort of bureaucratic force of habit, that the idea that, that these postures must be maintained and that, that they are bound up with a certain national prestige and international standing. And uh, I, I, th I think probably not unreasonably Quite a lot of politicians believe that there is more to be lost by taking the necessary step of, of going down the path of disarmament than there is to be gained for them. And I think there's, you know, there's there's some cynicism, and then there's some, you know, belief that this is how we've always been doing things, and we should we should continue. Thank you. Uh, that was very succinct and, and to the point. And yes, it's really it's really uh, surprising this kind of mismatch between people who understand how the world, this kind of cloak and dagger world work and, and outsiders who kind of feel that it's more surprising than fictional accounts might be. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm going to move the theme of the questions to uh, a set of questions about um, risks. Um, and um, I'm going to ask Kate, please, to be the person to first comment on those. We had a question from Bevis Gillett pointing out that, uh, Bill Perry's analysis uh, saying that uh, uh, the risks of nuclear catastrophe are now more likely than ever, uh, while a deliberate nuclear war is unlikely. So that's the uh, Bevis was asking uh, for comments on that and if the panel agrees with that. Um, there's also um, a question um, about whether planetary sustainability could ever be uh, compatible with militarism from Brees Cadbury. Uh, thank you very much. And then a final uh, question on risks um, is um, from Alan Dan uh, Dekololo Mahungu. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, we're talking about interest conflicts escalating around the world um, and that uh, weapons of mass destruction might be seen as a way of protecting interests but so asking for your comments on the extent to which a nuclear weapons three world uh is possible yeah uh thank you kate if you could if you could start us off on those ones okay not sure my note keeping <laughs> note taking kept up with that um great questions i mean there are so many great questions in both q a and chat uh, first of all, Bevis. Hi, Bevis. Good to hear from you. Um, yes, there's there's quite a lot of uh, research and data available about near misses. And of course, Bruce Kent is one of the great champions of people being alert to how many times over the past period, you know, since 1945, we've come incredibly close to uh, nuclear exchange and then all out nuclear war as a result of an accident. And there's... Um, you know, many, many times uh, where fortunately individuals have used their own judgment, you know, during the Cold War in particular, not to press press the button, you know, and often it was be, um, like a bear trying to climb over a fence into the <laughs> defence establishment or whatever, you know, into the base. Um, so I think, yes, it is, it is right to say that there is a, a very, very great risk of unintentional nuclear exchange, but I also think that increasingly um, there is the risk of actual intentional nuclear warfare. And I think this is very much increased by the development of these so-called 
um, low low yield nuclear weapons. You know, in fact, many of the low yield nuclear weapons are almost as big as the Hiroshima bomb anyway. But in so, so in some in some strange way, there's there's the thinking developed that if you have smaller nuclear weapons then uh, there's less likely to be nuclear war. Well, it seems to me if you have smaller nuclear weapons, which are described as low yield or you know, battlefield nukes or something like that, they are far more likely to be used. And, and where is the stop mechanism when you've used a small nuclear weapon against somebody? You know, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a disastrous development. So I think, yes, there are very great dangers of uh, unintentional usage, uh, but there are increasingly grave dangers of intentional usage. And, and that's why people like uh, Perry and others, you know, former people that have been kind of great uh, hawks, you know, military hawks, have come to the view that it's just too dangerous to have nuclear weapons, you know, and that they should be globally abolished. And I think that that's what we have to build on, you know, and as a campaigning organisation, we try and keep that vision really clear. Yes, there are all kinds of nuts and bolts on the way of reductions and this and that, but the goal of global abolition, you know, that has to be up there really central. And I absolutely agree with the point that Jonathan was making about, you know, changes as a result of COVID. You know, there's so many people and organisations saying, you know, no going back to the way things were before, build back better, uh, not as hijacked by Boris Johnson. You know, it was initially stated by the Secretary General of um, the United Nations. You know, we have there's a window of opportunity for doing things differently, for seeing security in a different way. And we have to seize upon that to ensure that policies change and we're not faced with any form of uh, nuclear warfare, intentional or unintentional. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, we've now got three minutes until <laughs> the time's up for this webinar. Um, so I'm sure we're going to overrun slightly if that's okay with everybody. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to skip straight to the uh, questions that focus on uh, disarmament, because I think it'd be nice to finish with a sense of discrete steps that might be possible um, after looking at some of the problems that we're facing. Um, so Mike Keeley uh, asked all the panellists to reflect on if what the discrete steps to the UK getting to zero nuclear weapons might look like. And I would add to that, what, uh, what do the international uh, situation need to, what are the international conditions for the UK to, to be at that point? Um, and John Mason also asked a question uh, asking about the effect of the US election on, on the possibilities for disarmament. Um, and we also had uh, an interesting question from Bill Ramsey, the SNP CND person, uh, asking about the implications of Scottish independence and, and how long it there would be for Trident to be removed from Scotland should it vote for independence. So, uh, once again, I appreciate there's a lot of questions there. So I'm going to circulate round the panel uh, in the order that you each spoken, asking for some reflections on those sorts of questions um, and some final comments. Uh, thank you very much. I will start with David Cullen. Thank you. Well, wow, these are really big questions. <laughs> um, yeah, concrete steps to disarmament. That I. I looked at this a little bit in the Trouble Ahead report. It, it wasn't a major focus um, of it. And, and uh, yeah, it, 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 the, this material got relegated slightly to um, one of the annexes, but I, I was interested in looking at to what extent the, the current upgrade programmes were cancelable and, and to what extent uh, uh, money already be committed to them. I, 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 th I think that if the UK decided not to produce all of the submarines that it's going to, that would be an immediate first step. It looks like they're, in terms of contract law, are committed to producing a couple. Um, but you could imagine a future where uh, a government decided to disarm and only those two were produced. The number of deployed weapons went down. I think, I think stopping patrol would be a really important early step towards disarmament. It's, I think, an unacceptable risk to have those weapons at sea. 
all the time. They, you know, while they are still in existence, they should be kept in a secure location and they should not be deployable. I think it's really unacceptable that they are. So th those would be the initial first steps. Um, if, if you're interested in uh, what things we look at the atomic weapons establishment, my predecessor, Peter Burt, wrote an excellent report on how that could be converted to civilian usage. I, I really uh, recommend that you take the time to look at that because it's a very interesting report. Uh, thank you, David. So some very discreet steps to do with managing the technologies, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's in terms of the actual submarines, the bits of kit or the uh, labs that produce, that, that, that work on, uh, that are instrumental to the UK's nuclear weapons programmes. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to move to Jonathan Porras and I'll point out that we've got another question just finally come in about uh, possible disarmament actions. Uh, relating to Jeremy Corbyn saying the younger generation needs to understand the nuclear threat more bluntly, so questioning whether it could be put on the uh, uh, national syllabus. Um, so I'll just put that out there as well, uh, in case Ola or Jeremy have anything to say about that. Uh, Jonathan, have you got any comments about the disarmament questions we've had? Um, Henrietta, thanks. I'm really sorry I'm going to have to um, drop off the call in a minute. Uh, and I'll leave that question to the significant expertise on this panel. There was a question about is planetary sustainability compatible with militarism? And I can say as quickly as possible, absolutely not. And for anybody involved in sustainability work who thinks that we can work our way towards a just, compassionate, sustainable world without dismantling the edifice of militarism, they're insane. On which note, I will leave you. I'm so sorry to have to go. But thank no, you. well, thank you very much for being here and thank you for being so clear about that. That was unambiguous <laughs> and to the point. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much uh, and see you soon. So I'll move uh, now to Ola, please, um, if, if you've got any comments about the disarmament questions. Yes, um, thank you very much, Henrietta. Uh, so just very briefly, um, concrete steps uh, for nuclear disarmament. Um, the very first thing that comes to mind is that all campaigners, whether disarmament um, campaigners or non-proliferation experts, should encourage the US and Russia to unconditionally extend a new start um, and not necessarily attach uh, unfeasible conditions to the extension of new start as we have seen uh, in the past couple of months. Um, thinking a little bit further, um, someone raised the, the strategy of the the ban treaty championed to divest from the bomb and I think this is a very important strategy in the sense that you know it's a death by a thousand cuts strategy wherein they they, they push the UK um, and other governments around the world um, to become more aware of the perspectives that have been raised and ignored for so long um, and I think looking at these innovative ways to stifle the 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 ecosystem that supports nuclear weapons is is the way to go definitely um but my final point is actually more related to the issue of nuclear risks um in within the context of um, steps for eventual disarmament i notice um, that there hasn't been enough or considerably noticeable um, engagement between nuclear disarmament campaigners and some of the options on the table for nuclear risk reduction as championed by the United Nations, by the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. And it's understandable because um, perhaps these step-by-step -step approaches might seem um, a little too uh, late and also might seem like engaging with these, um, uh, with these initiatives uh, might be selling out from the cause. But I think that if we were to look at some of the strategies developed within nuclear risk reduction, um, you know, we have, we're trying to close pathways in nuclear use. So the doctrinal, the accidental and the escalatory pathways. But if we have more engagement from the disarmament um, community with these strategies, we can try to push the non-proliferation experts to be a bit more ambitious um, in pulling together these nuclear weapon states to engage in dialogue and transparency to reduce um, the risk of nuclear use. Um, and on that note, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you. Great, thanks Ola. So this kind of sense, there's things that could be done at multiple levels. Uh, new start, 
uh, engaging top level nuclear weapons, uh, top level people within nuclear weapons states coming together to agree stuff, but also the actions of individuals matter, that campaigners can really get stuck into lots of these issues and there are things that can be done. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kate, I'm going to hand over to you uh, for some final thoughts about disarmament uh, from your point of view. Okay, well, <laughs> big question, obviously. <laughs> uh, just to pick up on one of the points there about um, young people and so on. I mean, to be honest, uh, the problem is not with young people. If you talk to young people or if you look at the polls, overwhelmingly, they're opposed to nuclear weapons. They think, you know, what crazy person invented nuclear weapons? It just seems such such, such a, an extraordinarily destructive thing to do. So they are, they are not the problem. The problem is the older generation, uh, the vested interests, people who are kind of stuck in Cold War thinking, you know, I mean, th those are the minds that we have to change, you know, people um, in in those kinds of interest, interest groups and um, sort of stuck thinking. So it's not, I don't think it's to do with the young people. And then in terms of ways of bringing about disarmament, yes, it, it has to be a multi-layered process, or there are many, many ways in which movement can be made. And I, I appreciate um, Dr. Samuel's point. To be honest, I think that as the most important thing is, is people power. You know, we're looking at what appears to be an intractable problem to do with the status of nations. As we know, that that's a really big factor. Concepts of power, you know, misplaced concepts of power. But people, again, sort of stuck in a rut thinking that they have to have nuclear weapons. And, and if you if you say you're going to get rid of them, then you're perceived to be weak and all that. You know, things have moved on and people have to realise that they've moved on. And there's no substitute, in my opinion, for people getting together, organising together, putting on public pressure. You know, at certain times it's demonstrations and events at bases, at other times it's mass lobbying and talking to your MP and all that sort of thing. But we have to have mass popular engagement. I don't believe that going to politicians or vested interests and making a good logical case is going to cut the mustard because the vested interests are there. We have to have a mass demand for change. And we've seen how in the past that has happened, whether it's in terms of the treaties being achieved in the past, like the INF Treaty or the Partial Test Ban Treaty or whatever. We've seen how that happens. And we've seen it in many, many other campaigning uh, contexts historically, you know, for um, uh, Equality, civil equalities and so on, you know, that, that, that has to happen. And so we need to get active and really, really bring about a change because it's in everybody's interests. And, and particularly here in nuclear weapon states, the onus is on us to do that. Because as people have said, you know, half the world is self-organized in, um, in nuclear weapons free zones. You know, many countries have signed up to the global boundaries. We're not in a minority. We are actually the global majority for nuclear abolition. And we have to make that real here as well as elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Another kind of rousing uh, call that, that we have things that we can do. We don't need just to, need to wait for people in, in decision making positions to make those decisions. Uh, so uh, I'm going to hand over now to Jeremy to respond to the disarmament style of questions. Um, Thanks. Uh, very thank briefly, you. to follow the points Kate made, that uh, I'm always struck by how different the debate, discussion and debate is about nuclear weapons between what is held here in Britain and the United States compared to that which one holds in almost any other country in the world. Uh, other countries in the world sort of think, what on earth are you talking about? Why would anybody want nuclear weapons? And uh, here it quite quickly um, goes into a thing saying it will nuclear weapons give us security, um, whereas in fact uh, uh, the danger of uh, nuclear weapons being proliferated and a nuclear war are obviously huge, which is what we've just been talking about. Uh, how do we take things forward? Well, Kate also is right that um, going to influence politicians by logical argument is always a good idea. Um, but 
it is it's made much more powerful if you're seen to be supported by a large body of public opinion and that actually is what makes a difference uh, because the pressures on politicians are absolutely huge subtly or, or not so subtly from uh, industrial interests and defense interests they're much less obvious and much less strong from um, those that want to see a different way of running the world. And so I believe absolutely in popular campaigning and uh, uh, taking big steps towards disarmament. And so how would it look in Britain? Strategic Defence Review, which concludes how expensive nuclear weapons are, questions their value. A feel good message to all world leaders of countries that have uh, nuclear weapons. How about you being part of on the side of history by saying you will sign a thing of no first use, you will sign a thing of no further development, you will sign a thing of absolute non proliferation, and you will carry out Article 6 of the MPT. Um, and that we have to engage with uh, all countries around the world, and in particular with China, because China gives a reach into engaging with North Korea as well. But I think it also, and this is what's come through with everyone's contribution today, it has to be overwhelmingly put in the context of the big lesson we've heard about global poverty, inequality, and lack of health care from the corona crisis, and the environmental disaster that the world is heading to. None of those issues are going to be helped by spending zillions of pounds on new weapons of mass destruction. Much better if we start to give security to those people that currently work in industries that manufacture these things, that your jobs will be secure in the future by investment in other things. That has to be a very important part of it. Otherwise, you simply don't get a hearing on the issues of um, uh, nuclear disarmament and peace around the world. I'm actually very hopeful very hopeful that um, a generation coming up will um, look at look at the world in a better and different way and are becoming more and more alive to the need to deal with in environmental insecurity by providing economic security for everyone in a sustainable world. The things are possible, but they do require a challenge to free market economics. They do challenge, uh, do need is necessary then to challenge the sort of military thinking that goes with it as well. But I'm actually hopeful. Good. That's nice to hear. Um, so we have had such an interesting session. Thank you very much to all the speakers, David Cullen, Jonathan Porritt, Olamide, Samuel, uh, Kate Hudson and Jeremy Corbyn. Between you, you've given us all an amazing sense of the reality of nuclear weapons here, and globally, the risks they, they bring with them, and also the state of disarmament the st and possibilities for next steps towards disarmament. Uh, like many of you, I'm, I'm left with a, a kind of, ah, oh, this is real feeling, but also a sense of op optimism, because we've heard from Kate and from Ola um, about some real tangible things that are going on in civil society. There's a real richness in the youth movements that were mentioned, uh, and in other public protest movements. And we also have uh, access to some really rich research uh, that, that are informing and steering some of these policy decisions, whether it's from Nuclear Information Service that's kindly hosted this event, or from the University of Sussex, uh, work from Bill Johnson and Andy Sterling that's underpinned some of the great questions we've been having. Um, so thank you very much. Do look up the recording if you're interested, and I hope to see you in some other circumstances sometime soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Henrietta. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.